There are some names that have done pretty well despite this volatility. How does it look to you? Yeah, I mean, I think the ones that you've seen do pretty well tend to be the enterprise stocks, so Zoom and Fastly and PagerDuty, some of these companies that have recurring revenue, clients that they've had for years and years, uh, good forecasting ability. Those stocks seem to have done fairly well uh, post-IPO. Uh, obviously, Lyft and Uber have seen a lot of choppiness, but, you know, I think with all these names, you're, you're in the first kind of weeks and, and months of trading, so it's going to be a, a really long story ahead of them. And so it's too early to tell really who are the kind of the winners and losers. Henry, this is the headline from earlier in the month on CNBC. NASDAQ, the pipeline for Chinese companies listing in the U.S. is stronger than it's ever been. You think that goes away? Well, it would be very interesting to this point about if, we, if Mark Cuban wants to shut down IPOs, that would be a huge shot in this trade war. Does it stay that way? I don't know. I do think that the IPO market is open. I think it's very instructive to look at Uber. Could not have been better advertised. Literally everybody in the world who wanted a shot at getting some Uber stock got it. That's very different from Beyond Meat and some of these other companies that most people had never heard of. They were price lower. <laughs> people can learn about them later and get excited about them later. We exhausted the demand for Uber when it came public. Um, and it has not been the case for some of the other IPOs. Cameron, what's going to happen as a result of how Uber has performed? I mean, there's, there's been some rumbling that right. some of these companies stayed private for too long. Actually, maybe the IPO process and being public would have benefited their discipline. Um, but, but I don't know if that's really resonating among the startup community and changing people's mindset. You think it has or will? You know, I haven't seen like a chilling yet in terms of companies that are being built or started. I think that the big question is going to be uh, what happens to the companies that have maybe similar models to Uber, like Postmates, for example, in the delivery space, is, I think, is looking to come out. And, you know, is the Uber IPO going to kind of affect them? But in the private markets, you saw Amazon put a big round into Deliveroo. Uh, DoorDash reportedly is raising a very large round right now. And so I think in the, in the private space, you haven't really seen the, the stumbles of the Uber IPO. Uh, having any effect. And let's keep in mind, they've built a $70 billion company. So, you know, as a venture investor, I think we'd all be lucky to have those kinds of uh, mistakes in our portfolio. Henry, I would actually add luck and coffee to the list with Uber and Lyft in terms of post IPO performance, uh, given just the chart over the past week, it's gone like this. Um, I, I realize that there's this debate about whether, you know, IPOs and, and how they're received by public markets adds a chilling effect. On the flip side, could it be a market top? Could you see IPOs continue to push through the pipeline if there is all this uncertainty around China and everything else and you want to just go ahead and get it out to market now? Absolutely. IPO market, like everything else in markets, has very clear cycles. It's possible that we're at the end of the cycle. Look at how much money a lot of the companies are losing when they go out and yet there's still appetite and you can look at Uber and say, oh, what a disaster. It still has a $75 billion market cap. Exactly. It is doing fine. Lots of folks have come in after the IPO, so there's still demand there. So, But to your point, IPO cycle always ends the same way, which is suddenly you have a whole lot of stuff shoved out right at the top and everybody gets killed and nobody buys anymore for a while. And then the pipeline recharges and you have some incredibly profitable company that seems as safe as the most safe investment out there that finally goes out and that opens it up again. Yeah. Yeah. But moving on to Tesla, always a new twist with them, <laughs> down 11 days in the last 12, but higher this morning as a leaked email to employees from Elon Musk says Tesla's Q4 deliveries are on track to hit a record high. Um, Henry, Elon Musk, Tesla, there's always some shift. Some of it has to do with the actual performance. Some of it doesn't. Some of it has to do with tweets. This one... Um, the, the main issue is capital, right? Do they have enough runway to get all of these mechanics right? And is China, that trade situation, going to throw a monkey wrench? I, this plans? is one of the stocks. Some stocks have religious communities around them. There's no other way to say it. They're, they're yeah. cult stocks. Elon Musk, extraordinary entrepreneur, has done things that are unfathomable, will continue to over time. But I would say there are 200 points in Tesla stock that vary around whether people are believing Elon in a particular moment or the fundamentals are looking so bad or issues are so so bad that people are saying, you know what, I just, I just can't get there. And that's where I think we are. Yes, they need capital. They need to run much more smoothly. And a lot of the more bearish analysts are saying, look, there's a demand problem now. And the company actually has to be restructured to meet the current demand, not some hypothetical future demand, which it doesn't look like they're well, on track for. You've, you've done, you've been an analyst, as we all know. <laughs> And Jonas has, he puts a 185 
valuation on the auto component of his call. That's how he, in part, gets to this bear case number. Isn't the $10 thing a tad irresponsible? Would you? Ten, well, uh, look, it, it is certainly surprising to see the rapid turnaround in, in big Wall Street sentiment on the stock. There's no question. But that said, I read Adam Jonas's note a few years ago because I was very curious because Tesla was over 300. And I was saying, you know, that valuation is just a lot on the come. Amazing. A huge part of his price target, which I think was then $400, was based on, on the grid. a future robo taxi business. It, hadn't, it was just a concept, a model on paper, and yet it had tens of billions of dollars of value in the future stock price. Now, the market is just simply not willing to take that on faith anymore. The whole autopilot thing is a problem. It's not an autopilot. There are a lot of concerns around that. And the fact that the new religious idea was that there are going to be a million robo-taxis next year driving all over the place, it's just, I'm sorry, it's just too out there for where the company is right now. Cameron, when you talk about the, the fervent community of long investors in Tesla, yeah. really the nucleus of that is Elon Musk himself. Um, a lot of focus now coming to, and Phil LeBeau, our Phil LeBeau has been reporting on this, this margin call strike price, this idea that he has hundreds of millions uh, in loans against his stock and that, at the, uh, that if that stock price falls to a certain level, Musk himself might be forced to sell. How big of a risk is that to the stock and also just to the company and the narrative here? I mean, it's absolutely a risk. I mean, you have a company with obviously a very um, uh, involved and, and large shareholding founder who, who's got these financial instruments that could affect the stock. Uh, but I, I totally agree with Henry. I think this is, this is a stock that has fanatical kind of religious following. And, you know, I think what's happening right now is really a crisis of credibility where there's there have been communications and tweets and things and people don't know what to believe uh, in terms of the analyst and investor community. But I think in terms of the product and, and, and you know, people's love for the cars, uh, that hasn't changed. So I think th this company is probably going to be built to last and be around for a long time. And Cameron, what's your take? What stabilizes Tesla here? I think just, you know, reassuring the market in terms of building their trust and credibility with, you know, the, here's the forecasting, here are the reports. You know, I saw something come out about cost cutting. Like, is that real? What does that look like? Um, so I think they're going to have to kind of rebuild that trust.